Estamos aqui diretamente de Londres, uma cidade muito importante para o rock, berço de várias bandas importantes do rock and roll e do heavy metal, mas hoje o assunto é punk rock. A gente vai falar com uma lenda viva, Mr. Glenn Matlock. Estou aqui com uma lenda viva do punk rock, um cara muito importante para a cena da música inglesa, é um membro, um dos membros fundadores do Sex Pistols, Mr. Glenn Matlock. Thank you, man, for. Hi, Fernando. Your... Okay. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here with you. So thank you so much for your time. Man. It's okay. My yeah. pleasure. So let me ask you, uh, talking about the beginning of of punk rock, who do you think was the main responsible for for creating that that punk movement or the punk r sound? Um, that's a very complicated question for this time in the morning. Um, <laughs> it wasn't one person. It was it was like a collective consciousness of a a small coterie of people in London, and then also it, it was kind of funny. It, At the same time, there was things going on in New York, and the people in New York hadn't heard what we was doing, and we hadn't heard what they was doing, because nobody had made any records at that stage. And everybody sort of seemed to come to the same result at the same time. And I think it was because everybody got fed up with what had been going on before at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think uh, what, what what do you think was the biggest legacy that punk rock left? Like, do you think that uh, maybe uh, after you guys started, it meant that you you brought the the rock and roll back to its roots, and and everybody could have a, a band after that well, again? Yeah, yeah I, th I think I think what we did is kind of simplify music again. You know, to me, rock and roll should be simple and it should be easy. And it had become very high, kind of highfalutin, high blown. You know, bands like Yes and Genesis. It was just loads of rubbish. And they did, and they did all that complicated music because they didn't have anything to talk about. Whereas, you know, with John, we did. There was stuff that had to be said, and John said it with a plum. You know, backed up with a real simple. Kind of musical stance, and I think that applies to most of the punk bands. When was the the first time that uh, the the punk rock movement from England got in touch with the uh, punk mov mo punk rock movement from like CBGBs and New York? Well, we was kind of hip to it at really early on, so like seventy four, seventy five, because Malcolm McLaren, who didn't form us, but we formed sort of in his kind of sphere of things, he had this shop down in King's Road. He'd been going backwards and forwards to New York because he had a clothing business and he used to go to clothing trade fairs. And he kind of got friendly with some people there and he brought back some flyers and like set lists of, of the Heartbreakers or television when Richard Hell was in the band. And then Richard Hell was in the Heartbreakers right at the very beginning. And there was like a list of songs, you know, like Blank Generation and stuff. I never heard them. But it just started just thinking. And then also, really earlier on, on we was friends with this guy, well, Malcolm was friends with a guy, and we became friends with him, a guy called Nick Kent, who was like the star writer for the enemy at the time. And I remember he gave us a tape that a friend of his had been working with an American band. And they had some really interesting stuff on it that hadn't been released. And we did one of those songs really early on because we kind of dug it. There's a song called Roadrunner, and the tape that he gave us was half of the album that his friend John Cowler produced for R John from Richmond and Modern Lovers, and it didn't come out for another year or so. So we were kind of like in the right place at the right time, but only because we put ourselves there. Uh, I suppose you played with some of, maybe some of your heroes. Uh, you, you mentioned Iggy, you played with Iggy Pop, you played with... Uh At the, with the faces, which are, well, is that, a big that, influence, right? That was my biggest buzz. I mean, that was the band that when I was 14, I used to stand in front of the mirror with a guitar that I couldn't play yet, pretending I was in the band. And then to go full circle and end up playing with them, it was great. And I just loved their material. And one was my all-time favorite guitarist. There's, there's something about his playing. And I did it because I was... When, my band after the Sex Pistols was a band called Rich Kids. Yeah. And... Um, 
we needed some keyboards on the track and we got Ian McGlagan in and I became mates with him. He's quite an affable fella. Um, and he's a great player. They're all great players. And to me, the faces were very important. A, when I met Stephen Paul for the first time and they was looking for a bass player and I said, oh, I play bass. And they said, well, what bands do you like? And I said, the faces. And they said, oh, so do we, you know. And then I went, not long after that, I went to, it wasn't the faces, but Ronnie Wood was doing a gig not far up the road in Kilburn. And when he'd done his solo album and he had Keith Richards playing and uh, Wally Weeks and uh, Willie Weeks and whatever the drummer was and Mac. And I went to see him. I bought a ticket and went with my girlfriend and we had cheap seats, right? And I, it was up at the top somewhere and we went up the stairs and it started getting a bit kind of dark and we'd kind of gone up one level too high, which wasn't open yet. And then we heard a noise and some people could see some people come downstairs and it was Steve and Paul and a couple of their mates who I'd only just met and they was all covered in soot and they'd broken in through the roof. <laughs> you know, so. It's a great story, man. How do you see the music, uh, the music today, like the music market, the music industry? Uh, what do you feel about it? Do you, do you see any great talents that could become, you know, the next ACDC or the next Pistols or some someone that will continue a career for the next 20, 30 years? Um, yeah, I'm sure some people will. But normally, I don't think it's how good an artist is. It's how good their manager are. <laughs> but there's always some something that comes from. I mean, Eminem's great. You know, I think he's important. I, I really like Beck. He's gone a bit quiet. He's cool. I like lots of... I mean, my favourite song, and it's the best thing I've heard for years and years and years, is that Farrell Williams thing, Happy. Really like that. It's great. You know, and I like Hey Ya by Outkast. That's more interesting than some bunch of old blokes playing a load of, sort of sec second-hand rock. Excellent. And uh, you're, you play, uh, sometimes you work as a DJ as well. What kind of music do you play um, when, you're, when you're DJing? Toe-tapping um I like getting people dancing. Like old, like, new, like a mixture of... Bit of everything. I mean, I think the one thing that I've been fortunate with my career, what it is, is that I've managed to somehow straddle what I was doing and the stuff before me, you know, like the Faces thing, and then I've worked with people that came after the punk thing. You know, I did a gig with Primal Scream and their mates of mine and... Yeah. You played with them as well, right? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not just like old 1976, 77, and that's the end of it. How, how did you feel like when you, uh, how do you feel like when you listen to versions of your songs, like, uh, especially like hard rock bands playing your songs? Like, I think uh, in the 80s, a lot of uh, heavy metal bands recorded old Sex Pistols songs, and most of them were uh, written by, partly by you. Well, as long as they fill in the publishing form, I really don't mind what they do. I did go and see, um, I went to Donington once because I was seeing this young lady who was working there as a publicist, um, and Megadeth did Anarchy and mm -hmm. got the words wrong, but the crowd was bigger than, up to that stage, all the people we'd ever played with put together, you know, crowd-wise. That was kind of a bit weird. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're, we're talking about the beginning of of the punk movement, and and we're saying like uh, that. You was reminding me about. It. Yeah, I was reminding you. Like I, I was uh, very young at the time, but it's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting story because you guys, you brought it. Like you, you, you made it like kind of democratic for anyone uh, to have a band. So today we have like a technology. And technology makes it, uh, in a different way, democratic for anybody to have a band. Is it somehow related to what you guys did? Or uh, what do you think of the, the advantages and, and, and the bad part of, of the technology where anybody can release an album and record an album? Right. Um, I don't know. I'm th th the thing is, because everybody does this and everybody does that, there's so much stuff that it's hard to keep track of it all. And... It's like if you don't do it, you're not in the in the in the field. But I don't know. It's, it, why, why is it? It's, I think the danger is. And my my son's in a band. Um, 
and they started playing around. But I always said to them, so the thing that people forget with the, with the Sex Pistols is we started out a lot before 1977. And we did loads of little gigs, kind of honing our acts in front of... I mean, we did we did some gig. There was a club up the Finchley Road in London, the Babaloo Club. And um, it was trailed on the radio. I had a band in New Who and all of that. We got there, you know, there was 13 people there and four of them were our roadies, right? I mean, this is really early on. But because we did those kind of gigs, we had a chance to really hone and get what we was doing together. So when we finally did get some proper publicity and it started building, it seemed like we came out with a splash. But these days, as soon as somebody's written half a song, they want to put it up on Facebook. <laughs> and it kind of gives the game away. It's like doing your dirty washing in public. So that's the difference. And I was talking about my son, and I was saying, don't, you know, don't put up a half-finished idea. Just sit on it, kind of get your act to kind of together. Thank you so much for having us, and it's been a real honor to uh, talking to you and uh, count on us to, to promote anything you do. And we hope to see you in Brazil, maybe DJing or doing your acoustic set. Uh, sounds good. Obrigado. De nada. That was Glenn Matlock, legendary bass player, guitar player, and songwriter on... Yeah.